Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. When we work in developing countries, my organization, the Institute for Liberty and Democracy of Peru, were brought in to talk about the informal economy. Every third worlder knows what the informal economy is about. It doesn't mean we define it the same way. It means that we know there's a whole bunch of people left outside. When we talk in the first world, everybody talks about property rights, and yet they're both very connected. Well, the problem is that, from our point of view, is this, it's that somewhere after the Second World War, somehow or other, something came into the world called the rule of law. And you are in Britain, and you've got property law, and it means this, and you've got criminal law, and it means that, and you've got family law, and it means this, money means that, and you go anywhere from Tunis to Cairo, to Peru, and you will find the same type of law. It's not exactly the same thing. Some things are common law, some things are statutory law. But essentially, you're in a westernized sort of world. So that would be about a billion people. And that covers the elites. And then there's about five billion who are not into that. They're into something else that we call the informal economy, which is not a different type of law. It's actually anarchy. It's many, 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 many times <coughs> types of local conventions that have one special characteristic about them, which is that uh, there's no scale. Everything you do lasts only two miles in this direction or two miles in that other direction. Then it begins another custom, then begins another system, so it's fragmented. And how can you produce a watch without scale? How can you do anything without scale? And to us, it's always fascinating. The world, therefore, is, I mean, almost categoricos, Immanuel Kant talk about categories. We've got the world divided into the before the communist world, the free world, men, women, south, north, people who eat garlic, people who don't eat garlic. How can the world not be seen from two very points of view, that there's one where there is a system called the rule of law, people that can talk to each other, can make commerce, airplanes can land, but another part where you can't, and that other part is five billion strong. One of the things that keeps us going from one place to another is really trying to find a way to define this, uh, to define this better. Because if you say informal economy, it means nothing. For example, in the, in the United States of America, it means nothing. You talk about property rights, to tell them, well, if some people have property rights or not, they'll say, you're a Republican. You like property rights. And if they're Democrats, they don't like property rights, because that's the defense of the rich. When all of a sudden, we hear, starting the 17th of December of 2010, that a young man called Tariq Mohammed Bouazizi self-immolates in the fair city of Sidi Bouzid in Tunisia because he's just been expropriated. He takes lighter fluid, he lights up, and complaining that his wares have been taken away. We start saying, my God, the first informal marker. We'd never heard of this before. We hadn't seen something so dramatic. What a painful way to go. And we start immediately sending Peruvians to look at their Peruvians, not because we're anything special, but we do study informality and we live with it all day around us. What we did, what our folks did, what our kids did going in there, the first thing is they said, let's find out what was easy lost. So they went to Sidi Bouzid, and they reconstituted from conversations with his colleagues, his family, how much fruit he had in his stall, and what was the value of the scale, and found out he had lost $225. Now, you don't commit suicide for that. It doesn't make sense. But the problem is that at the same time we were asking that question, we started finding out that he wasn't the only one. We have so far located 64 people who simultaneously immolated for the same reason. They were all businessmen who were outside the law, who were expropriated. And there were people around that filmed them, uh, cameras, microphones. And it always starts with somebody being very angry, very desperate, 
Every one of them before dying talked about expropriation. So you would ask them afterwards, because 40% of them have survived, do you know the word property rights? And the reply was, no. Does the word expropriation make sense? That's exactly why I did it. So they don't know property rights, but they do know what it means to have things taken away. One person commits suicide, and before two months are over, we had so far have 64 people identified as having also lit up for the same reason, and we're still looking at about another 160 candidates. There was some kind of herding going on. And if you attach that to the numbers we have gotten over the years of how many people we think work in the, we estimate, with good reason, work in what we call the extra legal economy or the informal economy, which we would be about 380 million Arabs, it sort of tells us that when these people committed suicide, it rang a bell with millions of others who said, I understand because I'm in the same problem, I'm in the same business, which doesn't mean they knew anything about property rights, which means they don't know anything, they knew it. even what the law means of informality, they just felt the empathy. As we worked around the case of Wazir, we started breaking around the other cases, we said this may give us the kind of stuff that you're able to pick up from the ground to try and get, and to try and get a Westerner to understand from our point of view what we mean by property rights. If you don't have a property right, what is it that gives Wazizi or gave Wazizi the right to be there, sometimes on a public space facing uh, the governorate? <laughs> what basically gave him the right to be there according to law was that he was as accepted as a vendor and he registered in a book set up by law, which exists and is in the Gouvernement, and according to which there are certain rules according to which he can buy and he can sell. Now, when you go and look at the book, because the authority said that he was illegal, he had no right to be there, and open the book of inscriptions, you don't find Boisizi's signature or his name. As a matter of fact, you don't find anybody's name. It's a law that is perfectly unused. It's too complex, it's too difficult. So the way he gets his right is because essentially, in countries like mine, the authority, local or central, has basically said, these are the conditions, you and I accept them. So when all of a sudden, for whatever reason, and we don't know, there's rumors as to what happened between Boisizi and the authorities, he was insolent, he wasn't insolent, he drank, we don't know. The important thing is that they, his, the, he went out of favor, and therefore when he was slapped and he was told, the fruit is taken away from you, all sorts of things happened because he didn't have rights. He had no money to take home. And he had to feed his mother and his sisters, so they weren't gonna eat that next week. But the other thing, he bought on credit, and he wasn't gonna be able to repay his credit. To who? To informal bankers, or formal bankers who had a little micro program and so he was bankrupt. He was gonna to get together with other fellows to actually set up a good fruit business. You've got a need for that, a vehicle, which is a business, which sets up hierarchies, which tells you who owns what, who has what authority. He wasn't able to get into that structure because no longer were they gonna allow him to get into it. It can take up to three years of red tape, eight hours a day to form a company, and he wasn't gonna get there anymore. When you operate without limited liability, you are in unlimited liability. It means every time you make a deal, it's as if you were putting all the 100 pounds, the only 100 pounds you've got in your pocket, on the table, and you're risking everything all the time. So as you go down item by item, and you start finding out what are the things that he could have or not have, he couldn't even raise. Uh, he could have said, well, look, the authorities here don't like me, but I've established a reputation. I'm right next to a bus stop, and everybody has always been for the last seven years buying fruit as they take, get off the bus and go home or to the office, they buy the fruit. That's goodwill, and I'm known to have sold it. They don't like me, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna sell my goodwill. And so I will take my stuff, sell it to somebody else, cash in, and move to someplace else. You can do that provided the law 
makes you that you're not Bozizi, but you're Bozizi and company, a separate person. But he didn't have a separate person, so there was nothing he could pass on except his body. That's what it means being outside property law. When Bozizi got expropriated, it wasn't that he got confiscated. It was that he worked in a lawless world where he had everything by one arbitrary decision can be taken away from him. And if you live in a country like that, and there's not one of you like that, not 10 of you like that, not 10%, not 20%, not 30%, but 50 to 60%, one such incident is a dramatic incident. And that's the only thing to, that to us helps to explain, it doesn't explain everything, but helps to explain to a great extent why all of these countries that can't come to agreements between themselves as to how to make a large force. There's so many different cultures, there's so many different jurisdictions, there's so many ways of being an Arab, they're not all the same. All of a sudden, in less than days, this cuts across all the cultures and all the nations. And the only thing we can think of is if you've got some kind of faith in Marx, and you do, and you think that there is a logic of collective action and that people group together in classes and when they're grieving together they can form a powerful force, then this explains it, except that it's not a proletariat. These are people who are entrepreneurs. Who are entrepreneurs. Now, when you're there, what do you do? The country's there. Now, do you start understanding what we mean by informal sector? It's a huge movement of people. And they're just more than the rest, and they impose a different thing. And instead of American authorities going around and saying, get out of here, they come in and say, well, welcome, welcome. This is called manifest destiny. This means the United States now, we're getting the Brits out, got the French out, now get the Latin Americans out. That's manifest destiny. So history writes it up as manifest destiny, but in fact, it was the empowerment of lots of other types of Europeans who came in and found what they couldn't get, obviously, in Europe. That's what we think is happening in the Arab Spring, because Wazizi occurred in every Arab country, in literally everyone. They're in Yemen, they're in Libya, they're in Morocco, they're in Algeria, they're in Egypt. In each one, people self-immolated, and somehow or other, the prairie fire lit up. In the Arab world, we started getting reactions. We've been called literally by in every country we've worked in by every new political actor there is. It's interesting, of course, then you would say that you're gonna get a voice from the Middle East that's gonna say, look, this is really all about markets. Or let's just say it's about modernization. That could happen. Or let's accept that we've been in business for the last 700 years by cheapers. There was 700 years ago, you could draw a check on Beirut and cash it in Singapore. We've always been there and we've just never let our own people be there. This has never been capitalism. This has always been mercantilism, which is capitalism only for a few, and an Arab voice could write. It could be, I have my doubts, because the Arab culture is so rich, it's so overwhelmed, that I get the feeling that it's like many Latin Americans whom we have to fight against, the status quo that we have to fight against, which look to the past and say it's our destiny. That's where we come from. We're not built to be modern like the other people. We have other traditions. We have other virtues. If there's one thing I think that my institute has demonstrated, at least in the parts of the world that we've worked in, including Peru, is we've known how to seize the moment. So I told myself, now here is Rohan who works for a prime minister who talks about property rights all the time. And uh, hey, this is the moment. And it's perfectly okay, as opposed to my country, where sometimes you say something and everybody considers that it's an insult to come and say, well, this is a time for leadership. You're seeing proper rights, and you're seeing it in a, wider, in a wider scale. I mean, if you're a Mexican, property rights is what it's all about. Mexico went all the way to Arizona and La Florida, and it went to Texas and Cali. And, you know, we went really in it, San Francisco, Los Angeles, hey. So that is in Birmingham, that is, that's us. So property rights has a lot to do with how you conceive territory. It's something that's got to be brought inside the language or we're not going to be able to understand 
what this evolving sort of consensus that some people call the status quo is all about. I mean, we're trying to understand what it is that the Industrial Revolution made, where it's going, where it's heading. We don't really know. We've got to make, we've got to try and understand it somewhat. And we're not going to understand it if we don't find out what the two billion did to get ahead and the three billion did to get, stay behind. This is a time for leadership, for somebody to put this issue of uh, property rights on the table, understand that we human beings live on the surface of the earth. We've got two ways of looking at it. One is called territory, sovereignty, and the other way is looking at it is property rights. And it is a good idea to look at the good and the bad sides of it and put it to the table and ask yourself if it isn't the reply not only to issues that relate to what the Arabs are doing, but the land-grabbing rebellions that are taking place all over the third world as your multinationals of the Chinese come in and start buying our land to start doing all sorts of things in the future. And that it might have a lot to do with a lot of your financial crisis as well. Thank you. I think what your work has shown, you've talked about some of it in the, the Arab world, is that there is this real clamor. People are desperate to try to formalize their activity, to try and get rights that underpin their, their work. I, I wonder if you might talk to this incredible, you call it your accordion, um, but I think shows the challenges involved in trying to formalize your activity. Um, sure. Most of the people we had met, at least in Egypt, in Egyptian jails, that had a business, started first of all trying to have a legal business. This is their story. I could go, I think, twice around the room with this accordion. Page by page is the different red tapes, red tape steps they had to take. We got the pictures of the documents. And uh, a bakery is, for example, close to 50, 550 days. So to register a bakery in Egypt, this is what your research showed. Yeah. Took, would take someone 550, day, 550 right. days, working 10 hours a day. That's right. And how much would it cost? And it cost uh, 6,100 pounds, which I think is something like 25 times what they would earn in three years or something so, like so that. This it's is, prohibitive. So this is the kind of formal legal process, right? I mean, it's completely absurd. What we have found, for example, this is Tanzania. We put a team there of 975 people, uh, and the purpose was to find out what was the rule of law on the ground. Mm. And we didn't find one piece of territory that didn't have a title to it, but it was not a government title. They were local. They have a tendency to document. Mm. They document their stuff. But of course, it's like early Europe. Everybody's got their own form, so it has no scale. Right. Um, but we found it, let's just like, there, what you see are the backsides of bulls and cows. We haven't found a bull and a cow without a private brand on it. They've got this sort of deregulation thing behind them. This is a typical conservative uh, right. ploy. And uh, it, is, it isn't that this illustrates why they're, they're outside the law and right. why they're desperate. Right. But what it doesn't manage to illustrate, which I think is very important, is what they themselves would like to see. Yeah. And therefore, you find, what one finds out is that at the end, after all these economic arguments, you always end up with the issue of democracy. And the issue of democracy is, has anybody asked them? Right. And by asking them, I don't mean ask their leaders, the Indian chiefs, yeah. so to speak, in cowboy language. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about all the Indians yeah. with what just they, one feather. What do they actually do? What, what do they, they actually do? Yeah. We haven't found, we were told that in the Peruvian jungle, officially there was 1,500 tribes. We found, found out. 5,000, and we haven't found one communal house. Right. We haven't found one communal tree. So it doesn't mean that there isn't one somewhere. It just means that it would be a good idea not only to consult with them. Right. Why not forget consultation? Why not let them decide where they want to go? And that process doesn't exist, at least in any of the countries we're That's working. Dangerous idea. Thank you.